So, we continue with our discussion on in God casting, uh, there is a 35th lecture and if you remember I was talking about uh, the in God casting setup, where I have shown you with a schematic or a line drawing the two molds M 1 and M 2, uh, the ladle from which molten metal is being fed uh, and this is the two types of molds that I was talking about narrow end up and wide, wide end up okay. and I was talking about hot top into the hot top uh, to keep the molten steel uh, molten uh, liquid for a prolonged time uh, basically uh, aluminum is added okay. and these are called anti piping compounds in the industry. So, there are some oxides and aluminum those oxides react with aluminum produce a heat and as a result of which that heat you know helps uh, the solid here to maintain and this part is anyway going to be rejected okay. The hot top part is not to be accounted for as far as the ingot yield is concerned. Similarly, this pigot part is also you know uh, once the plate is removed is going to be cut off and then a nice neat portion of the ingot uh, will be ready uh, you know from for the viewpoint of supplying uh, to the customer. Now, once the complete solidification has taken place and the complete solidification uh, as I said you know depending on the size of the ingot could be several hours. So, when the ingot has more or less fully solidified uh, the mold uh, ingot is stripped okay. So, and is exposed to the environment uh, whereby you know uh, the heating will and uh, the cooling is going to take place uh, predominantly by uh, radiation. So, when the ingot is stripped or the mold is removed okay, uh, these molds uh, you know are at a high temperature 800 900 degrees centigrade okay. and so is the surface of the ingot which is red hot and the from there uh, the ingot subsequently loses its heat the ingot is also covered sometimes with you know uh, sand and other things. So, as to uh, uh, have a compatible rate of cooling. Uh, because all of a sudden once you expose the ingot okay, the radiation loss becomes too much and as a result of which thermal stresses tends to set in the ingot. So, we all know that uh, the solidification takes place uh, and obeys uh, as a parabolic rate law and that is also largely obeyed in the case of ingot casting. These parameters A and B this what is this x? This x represents the growth of the oxide layer. So, suppose if I if I can draw an ingot like this okay. So, suppose the ingot looks like this, this is my ingot and then you will see that you know this ingot rarely will undergo any depression because because of the hot top you have been feeding in continuously the uh, hot metal into the cavities which results as because of you know the piping or the pipes which form uh, because of <coughs> solidification shrinkage and we have primary pipes and secondary pipes also we will see that later on. Okay. Uh, so, essentially what happens is uh, that we have solidification proceeds from so the growth you know from both the sides and that is how the solidification front advances okay. and <coughs> so these are the roughly the contours of the solidification front at different instant of time and the growth that is what I say that at certain time this is the thickness at some other time this is the thickness at you know some other time this is the thickness. So, the thickness is and this is how the growth of the solidification front is taking place as a function of time and that is what is x. So, the x is the distance of the solidification front from the wall and this T essentially represents the time and A and B are two constants which are the characteristics of the mold material and the solidification process itself. So, this if this is known like this, so one should be able to see that at what point uh, the, the, the solidification front from both the sides will merge and that possibly will give you a rough idea about the kind of solidification time and it is at that time you can now expose the ingot uh, to the surrounding environment okay. and once 
you do this by overhead cranes because there are arms on the side of the molds okay and the overhead crane will latch onto this okay and then you know lift up and lift the mold to cool it down uh, to the atmospheric temperature when all our reactors have been preheated you have noted little we will only put little into service provided the little is preheated tan dish we will put to you know tan dish in use only when tan dish is preheated but the mold is never preheated okay because we want the mold to absorb heat so lower is the temperature of the mold uh, the better is the its capability to extract heat from the solidifying casting itself but nonetheless what happens is the mold is never at room temperature because of the recycling of the mold it takes infinitely long time for mold big molds so the massive molds to come to room temperature once they are used so by the time in the mold material is recycled and that recycling will essentially necessitate that the molds are inspected molds are cleaned okay and in the whole process when you put the mold to use they are never at you know 29 degree centigrade or 25 degree centigrade they may be at 60 degree 65 degree and so on and so forth and that is the residual heat left from uh, the previous campaign that is what it is. These ingots uh, so we have the setup will contain uh, a little uh, a trumpet uh, runners and the ingot molds and we will have to have you know a large number of ingot molds uh, in the plant overhead uh, cranes for lifting them the mold management etc is also very tricky we have to you know see the surface of the mold mold inspection mold cleaning etc are huge operations and uh, they are cumbersome also to some extent when the mold is very very heavy so once you form the ingots these ingots basically are characterized in several parts one is called a killed ingot and semi killed ingot and rimming ingot and rimming ingot and there are different degree of rimming will give you different i will mention that what is that rimming these are essentially extremely low dissolved oxygen so aluminum kills steel okay there is no oxygen we are talking about 10 ppm oxygen or so semi kill steel is intermediate so and as you all know that during the solidification process carbon is going to be re rejected into the into the liquid ahead of the solidification front you know oxygen is going to be rejected because they have less solubility in the solid state than in the liquid state and as a result of which if the rejection of the solutes is such that you know not after 10 percent solidification not after 20 percent solidification but after 60 70 percent solidification has taken place now the liquid remaining liquid has become quite rich in carbon and oxygen that now the carbon and oxygen reaction can take place and that kind of a steel will call about you know it is a medium carbon steel basically where you have quite a bit of you may have about 70 80 ppm of oxygen okay and which will necessitate or precipitate into uh, or lead to carbon oxygen reaction for example only towards the later part of more than 70 percent in got solidified okay so there what happens is that because the ingot is solidified the top of the ingot you know is solidified because it is exposed to the environment okay and if 80 percent of ingot is solidified and then carbon monoxide bubble has formed and those bubbles can be deep seated bubbles here and as a result of which what happens is they can compensate for whatever little shrinkage is there in the system. These are all chemical steels are also called little balanced steel that means little balanced is why you control your deoxidation to such a level leave the residual oxygen to such a level that you know unless and until steel is solidified to 7, 70 to 80 percent okay the concentration of carbon and oxygen will not reach the threshold value which will disturb the existing equilibrium and lead to carbon oxygen reaction forming carbon monoxide bubble which will eventually leave in steel be left in steel. On the other hand rimming steel ingots okay these ingots are low carbon basically so therefore they have very high oxygen content so this is highest dissolved oxygen at the end of deoxidation or at the end of processing before casting is highest and this is lowest and as a result of which what happens is uh, that uh, you know you have quite a bit of carbon oxygen reaction right from the moment you put in got into the solidification so once 10 percent has solidified then you want the rimming action to take place so the rimming in got basically looks like it gives a structure like some solidification has taken place and then very nicely the bubbles have 
started to appear here. So, oxygen is high that means carbon is low. Okay? So, typically in the ingot casting process uh, what happens is that if you have lowest oxygen then you have essentially have large aluminum content and these steels also have uh, you know large uh, inclusions. On the other hand in these cases if the, if the bubbles that you generate these bubbles are what these bubbles are carbon monoxide bubbles and you want them to generate once a skin has formed some solidification has taken place because then when you will roll the ingot these bubbles are going to be collapsed. So, these are soft steel because you have. So, you have to control that you know it is not so easy that if you, if you have these bubbles close to the surface then these bubbles will undergo oxidation and that will create problem because in the process of rolling the oxides and metals do not weld together okay? and as a result of which defects are going to be originated. So, deep seated bubbles are an essential requirement. So, there is a necessity that you have to have a thick rim that is the name and then the bubbles would uh, form uh, such that you know uh, these are soft steel and these are very hard steel you know because you have low oxygen. So, you have uh, in terms of carbon content they are very high. Okay. So, various kinds of in terms of their carbon and oxygen content we are not talking about here much of aluminum you know uh, <coughs> deoxidation etcetera. So, in terms of uh, carbon content and the residual oxygen content uh, we can expect that if you interpret that high residual oxygen essentially means that we have uh, you know uh, smaller amount of carbon in the system in that case what happens is that we can have carbon oxygen. Uh, reaction uh, taking place. And in this case what happens these rimming actions are like bubbling actions okay? and the supply of atmospheric oxygen. So, the bubbles are rejected of iron droplets it gets oxidized and it supplies oxygen and that is how also uh, the oxygen gets in into the system. So, this a little bit higher oxygen originally present oxygen together with the oxygen which comes into the system uh, from atmosphere why the droplets of iron ejected because of the bubbling actions or formation of carbon monoxide bubble actually sustain the rimming operation. The main trick here is to control the stage at which the rimming will start okay? and rimming we want rimming to start uh, because when only when a thick crust has formed so that the, these bubbles are not exposed to the free surface. So, these are you know uh, typically different kinds of uh, ingots that are produced through the ingot casting uh, process uh, and these are used in typical uh, you know uh, what do you call the niche applications uh, very specific kind of an application different applications and uh, they are not uh, quite common these days. Uh, so, only when there is a requirement strong requirement about the quality of steel and as I have indicated that because the solidification in the mold is going to be slow. So, we can understand that you know chances of inclusion flotations is going to be larger. Okay, and the grain size which is going to be forming are also going to be you know the homogeneity in the structure is going to be better, cracks are going to be less, segregations are going to be relatively less because the solidification rate is small. So, properties wise the ingots are better, but the productivity wise you know ingot casting is not a very viable uh, rule. So, these are th in the old good old days uh, this is the way the ingots used to be classified. So, I thought that I will just mention, uh, but they may not be too relevant you know uh, in terms of present day steel making uh, operation. Uh, for example, if you want to produce rimming steel you know uh, in uh, through continuous casting it becomes very difficult actually. Okay? Rimming steel is perhaps next to impossible I mean you require a great amount of expertise in order to produce uh, rimming structure. And this the word rim comes from this, this is the rim which is the solid crust and these are the CO bubbles. Double B L E S. Okay. <coughs> the ingots which uh, we produce through ingot casting uh, uh, contains uh, can contain many defects and most importantly they have pipes and uh, primary pipes and we circumvent it also primary and secondary pipes. This is one equation. So, we have been got here 
if you have pipes it looks like this and the secondary pipes looks like this. This is an ingot without any hot top practice. So, if pipe forms here what is there? This is these are all oxides now they have come in contact with the atmosphere and it is oxides and therefore, we have to this is this becomes the useful part of the ingot and so the yield of the ingot can be severely constrict restricted or limited you know if such long pipes can form because of uh, certification defects, but these pipes can be eliminated completely by the use of hot top because the hot top is going to be feeding molten metal into this uh, pipes. Secondary pipes of course, do not are not of much concern because when you will roll the ingot okay, subject it to rolling mills they will tend to get welded because there is no contact of molten metal with oxygen. We have inclusions. and these inclusions as you all know could be of deoxidation origin or could be from the runner as I have integrated you know told you because in the ingot casting what happens is you do not have you know uh, because the material which is going to flow inside the mold uh, that can solidify in contact and there what happens is that uh, you know the, the, the worn out refractories can get entrapped. So, you have typically in steel you have you know a solid part as it solidifies you will have a solid part around the mold wall and then you have a mushy zone okay and for steel the mushy zone is quite large and if once worn out refractory etc get into that mushy zone it will not be able to float up okay so therefore inclusions exogenous and exogenous and endogenous exogenous could be the entrapment of the mold powder for example mold powder are going to be dropped into the mold you know uh, manually and they can also get entrapped into steel forming defects and if you, as, I, as I have indicated that if you find out that the inclusions contained in ingot you know have sodium or potassium then you can say that because the mold powder contains uh, sodium as well as potassium. So, therefore, uh, those inclusions have originated exogenous inclusions have originated from mold powders. On the other hand, if you have exogenous inclusions containing magnesium, possibly you can say that it is the runner refractory or uh, you know the refractory from uh, the template worn out refractory from the horizontal or the vertical part of the runner. And of course, deoxidation or we can say endogenous inclusions they are also and these are of deoxidation origin which we have studied. So, this is also one kind of a defect. Blow holes and pin holes are some kind of a defect blow holes and pin holes this is micro porosity and blow holes as you can see the blow holes can form at sporadic locations one or two locations, but if the blow holes form inside the ingot main body of the ingot it is not of much concern. If the blow hole forms close to the surface then it can be considered as a major, uh, but if you major defect pin holes are pin holes porosities are dangerous porosities. Okay, pinhole porosity is basically formed because of you know hydrogen content, uh, higher hydrogen content of steel, and then you, you may have problem uh, you know because hydrogen uh, initial the, the susceptibility of the material final material to crack you know is, uh, is a function. Pinhole porosities are essential indication of high hydrogen content in steel. Okay, and high hydrogen content essentially means that there is a great possibility for the final material to become susceptible to <coughs> hydrogen embrittlement which is a very important uh, phenomena. Then we have segregation which is also very important and micro segregation is we know uh, you know uh, what it is. So, the final steel we can have you know which solidifies in this region can have significantly different composition uh, than the first part of the ingot. Okay. So, ingot can require considerable amount of thermal homogenization okay, to level out those kind of a difference in concentration. In this case we have positive segregation and we may have negative segregation also. Positive segregation, there are two phenomena which we call as micro segregation and the macro segregation. Micro segregation is the characteristics of the solid alloy solidification process we all know. Okay. First 
metal to solidify is pure, the last metal to solidify is impure. On the other hand, macro segregation okay, is that micro segregated regions, if because of the fluid flow condition they are moved over a large distance, then we say that segregation in the ingot has become macro segregation. Okay. So, two types of segregation are possible micro segregation, which is the characteristics of alloy solidification, macro segregation, which is due to flow characteristics present in the system itself. For example, you can imagine that the first ingot to form, the first crystal to form here could be extremely pure, but because of fluid flow condition, if that crystal is moved here, then it will cause a segregation, but why has the segregation taken place? Because this was supposed to be here, and I find that this is going to this is here. Okay, so the fluid flow condition in the system has you know dislodged this particular crystal and has taken it. So the flow condition in the ingot is uh, very very important, and the flow takes place because you will be you know uh, filling this 10 ton material in 20 minutes, half a ton per minute is the flow rate. Okay, and these pigots could be about you know couple of centimeters diameter. So, you have large velocities here and you can have a huge fountain kind of a structure. The flow is gushing into the ingot mold and as a result of which there is a chance that you know uh, the flow can dislodge uh, some crystals uh, from uh, the vicinity of the mold wall. Now, if C is the local concentration and C naught is the bulk concentration okay, and we say that there are two possibilities that one is this and C minus C naught is less than 0. So, the concentration we know that if the metal is pure, then it is going to be heavier, if, okay, particularly in the context of steel, if the because steel has large density. On the other hand, if the metal is impure, okay, it is going to be lighter, it is going to be above. So, therefore, this is if it is pure material, if it is pure, Then what happens is the pure material has larger concentration, okay. uh, it has high density, pure material has smaller concentration and high density. So, therefore, this is going to be now um, concentration is smaller, higher density. So, therefore, this concentration is smaller than this concentration. So, C minus C 0 and C 0 is the mean composition concentration of alloy concentration in the ingot itself. So, when this is smaller that means, this is pure okay, then this is less than 1 and this is called as a negative segregation and when this condition is fulfilled we will call it as a positive segregation. Looking at this because this is high density this condition is corresponds to high density. So, therefore, I will say that in the ingot region ingot Okay. This high density region is going to be higher the density, it has a tendency to settle down. So, the negative segregation region are going to be here towards the bottom part. On the other hand, positive segregation are going to be in the upper part because it is lighter. Okay. So, there are two zones where we can find uh, the segregations and that is what is explained here. So, these are the kind of defects that one would see uh, you know in uh, in good casting. Uh, processes and of course, cracks as I have indicated the last one these are very very important. The yield of the ingot determines you know these defects determine the yield of the ingot. You may produce an ingot, but you may not be able to sell that ingot because it contains too much of blow holes, it contains lot of segregation, it contains cracks etcetera. So, producing ingots on a sustained basis without defects is the main challenge in steel making condition because you have you know the conversion process must not introduce defects in steel that is the requirement okay other than that because if you you know cool steel it is going to solidify just like the way as you said if you take you know hot metal containing carbon you pump in oxygen carbon oxygen reaction will take place at 1600 degree centigrade there is not much novelty in it and so therefore but at what rate you are going to solidify you know whether you are able to converse uh, convert liquid into solid you know uh, without any of these defects, these are of major concerns in the whole thing. So, I would write that this is also from powders, okay, exogenous powders and refractories. So, let us now start discussing about continuous casting of steel. I have left this figure on the board from my last lecture 
I have to be able to explain to you. So, that is what the continuous casting setup is. As I have indicated that ingot casting is a batch process, the capacity of ingot casting to handle large quantity of liquid metal is very limited and this I have time and again said and I have also with the set of figures and numbers I have shown that you know if you are talking about a 7 million ton steel plant uh, producing 10 ton size ingots on a daily basis perhaps you will require 1000 ingots to be maintained. So, large number of ingots will be necessary if you want to restrict yourself to ingot casting process in order to match with the rate of the blast furnace hot metal production and the turnover rates of the basic oxygen steel making furnaces. You will require many overhead cranes, you will require a huge program for this maintenance of these ingots okay? and most importantly that the ingots 10 ton ingots you know you will have it will require significant because how the what are the forms in which steels are going to be used they are not going to be used in the form of ingot. Okay? So, subsequent amount of rolling uh, and forging will is going to be huge amount of rolling and forging will be necessary in order to form necessary artifacts out of these ingot molds and that is an in, you know intensely energy uh, demanding process. So, energy intensive process. So, subsequent mechanical working of large ingots uh, you know are extremely energy consuming. So, there is an increasing tendency that so there has been a tendency you know to circumvent all these problems that we require a process which has a high turnover rate which can match with my BOF and blast furnace hot metal production. Okay? I can have you know may not have that much space required to you know treat 100 1000 uh, mold on a daily basis so many overhead cranes etcetera. So, I can work with you know just two molds or maybe four molds or just six molds for one single caster and you know for one single section and uh, that would be much more convenient and most importantly that I can produce here sections of different sizes. What we produce here? We can produce the common sections are known as billets, blooms and slabs. These are the most common sections. Uh, then we have uh, sections like uh, you know this is also a section beam blank caster in building construction it is enormously used. So, slabs beam blanks not so common. So, these are the most common. Billets are what? Billets are like square cross sectional products, steel products. Billets are, so this is I will say 1, this is 2, this is 3. So, 1 is something like uh, 100 mm into 100 mm, that is what is the size. Max, you go to Bloom, that is bigger, okay? that could be something like 250 to 300 mm cross section 300 mm, 300 mm to 300 mm. If you go to slab for example, this is number 2 and if you go to slab the slabs have a cross section like this, where the thickness could be about 200, 250 mm and this could be 1600 mm. There could be 800 mm slab also, 1200 mm slab also. I am just giving you again one set of representative figures. Then we have a thin slab casting also, thin slab casting, thin slabs. And thin slabs essentially means that we have slab of 1600 degree centigrade, but the thickness is only 50 mm. And the other end, the most newest process, we have strip casting, where we have thickness. Strip is also like a slab, okay? but its thickness is extremely small and what is the thickness we are talking about? 2 to 5 millimeter. So, conventional slab 250, 200, 250 mm thickness, thin slab 50 mm and 
then we have a strip. If you can produce strip, there is no hot working involved. You can take those, okay, and then the, you may have noticed, you know, while traveling, the trucks carrying huge hot roll coils, and those hot roll coils, you know, are made from 250 mm uh, slabs most in most of the plants, or from 50 mm plants. So the extent of working is significantly less to produce that, you know, hot strip coil or the coils or the sheets then it is in you know uh, with respect to uh, an in god this will require you know, formidable amount of uh, working in order to get to that particular uh, geometry so this is this could be you know 10 ton size in gods what could be diameter maybe you know uh, close to 900 mm that could be the diameter okay and then you are trying to reduce the thickness from 900 mm to about 2 3 millimeter so, you can imagine that how much of hot working will be necessary, but here you already have 50 mm. So, if you want to go to 2 3 mm, not that much hot working is going to be. So, continuous casting is a relatively less, you know, uh, demand of energy is much less. So, for the same product, if you switch from ingot to continuous casting, this is the order of energy which is saved megajoules per ton of steel. Forget about those ingot maintenance, forget about the cost of 10,000, 1,000 ingots. Merely the hot working part, which is very, you know, which is very energy intensive, if you can produce a near net shaped, that means it is a, it is a shape closer to the requirement of the customer. So, if you have to produce that strip or that sheet, you know, switching over from ingot casting to continuous casting can give you an energy advantage, advantage of about 2 to 500 megajoules per ton of steel. So, capital expenditure is of course, larger okay, to set up a continuous casting is an expensive machine, okay. but on the other hand once you have you know, the payback period is also very small. So, you can get your money back in no time because the turnover rates is very, very uh, large. <coughs> in the continuous casting machine, so we have discussed a little. So, this is a typical setup of a continuous caster and we have the molds here and as I have indicated already the molds are copper cooled or copper molds with water cooled. So, cold water enters here and cold water air flows out and there could be a difference in temperature about 6 degrees centigrade because the flow rate of water is extremely large. These molds, so we have are fed with what is known as SEN submerged entry nozzle. So, again the purpose of the submerged entry nozzle is to protect molten steel from coming in contact with the atmospheric air. And the submerged entry nozzle are not of unique geometry depending on the thin slab or slab geometry or bloom or bullet casters they have different geometries. Okay. Conventional bloom casters have a straight bore nozzle or alternatively one can have four such ports. So, if you if you you know look at the end this from this side also there is going to be one nozzle here. So, if I take you know a duster okay, and then you show this port is going to be one on this side, one on this side, one on this side and one on towards me. Okay. So, there are four port nozzles could be also there. Okay. So, this is one design or you can have a straight bore pipe. On the other hand, if you have a thin slab casting, a slab casting, then you have you know something like a twin port and this twin port SENs are going to be. So, this is from this is ladle from ladle molten metal comes into the SEN and this is the SEN and this is another geometry of SEN and uh, the geometry of SEN in this particular case is even more complex. So, different kinds of SEN uh, is used in order to deliver molten metal uh, to the flow pattern in the mold is very important and that is why we you know uh, design and redesign the SEN in order to create proper kind of conditions here. The SEN fits molten metal into the mold and we have just like the ingot casting you have mold powders here otherwise the metal is going to be exposed to the atmosphere that we do not want 
okay. and this mole powder also acts as a lubricant between the air also the copper coal mold okay, and the, as the ingot solidifies because it is water cooled it does not undergo that much expansion on steady and at steady state condition. So, one it has reached its steady state dimensions, but the cast casting uh, shrinks because of the solidification and as a result of which between the mold and the ingot okay, there is a gap which is created and the mold powder tends to fill that gap enhancing heat transfer and also providing lubrication. What is lubrication? Because these molds are not stationary because it is water cold mold. So, there is a good chance of the solidifying ingot to latch onto the mold wall and uh, get some you know centered here. So, so, so the mold okay, vibration of the mold, the mold does what is known as reciprocation. It is a reciprocating mold and this reciprocating means it does not go 1 kilometer down. Okay. It goes down and this molds could be how much? This could be about you know for a bloom caster 0.8 meters less than a meter or so okay, or 1.2 meters max and therefore, it can go down by 4 centimeter or 3 centimeter and then come up. So, that is the reciprocation reciprocatory movement that is going and it is basically because of that reciprocation mo movement what happens is uh, the solidifying metal which is hot it does not tend to get welded to copper. Uh, copper mold wall. Okay. Sometimes the mold wall is also coated with ceramic material you know to facilitate uh, this. So, during this reciprocatory movement the molten metal which uh, uh, sorry the slag which uh, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the powder which you know stays at the top it gets liquid uh, okay, and that, that liquid flows out. Uh, so, if you draw uh, you know the mold wall like this and then if you draw the casting Okay, the casting goes something like this because more and more heat transfer is taking place. So, the gap is going to be bigger. Okay. So, this is my this part is the copper mold and this part is casting it is an exaggerated view and now this is the part which goes up and down okay. and this could be only you know micrometer to uh, maybe at the most 1 millimeter thick, but this space is going to be filled up with my powder okay. and this powder because it is water cooled here the powder is going to be liquid at this particular location and maybe solid powder is going to be. So, there is a characteristics difference of the powder you know from the surface of the casting to the surface of the copper mold. The design of the mold in continuous casting machines could be you know horizontal or uh, vertical then we have uh, also a curve mold. And vertical molds with vertical discharge very rarely used vertical mold with horizontal discharge that is also rarely used in the continuous casting industry okay. this sort of a design it will be it will be very difficult for you to see the curvature actually if you look at the mold you know the curvature is uh, possibly uh, it, it does not give a you know, good visual impression that it is really a curved mold. So, you have to carefully watch it, it you know, watch the mold in order to find you know in, in order to make sure or in order to be sure that it is indeed uh, curved and this is you know in certain sort of a cam kind of a attachment and that is what uh, you know oscillates uh, the mold. Some molds have different long molds have you know different curvatures also one single curvature is not there. Okay. So, there are different kinds of designs and the mold design has evolved quite a bit. Uh, so, we can understand continuous casting was non-existent before uh, you know BOF steel making process because the in those days the production rate of steel was lower. So, even though Bessemer conceptualized about continuous casting process you know uh, in 1850s or around that time, but the continuous casting machine became uh, a necessity once the BOF process was installed because the casting process has to match with the turnover rate of the BOF converter. So, it is only as I have said 1952 was the first year you know uh, of uh, commercialization of BOF LD steel making process. So, around that time 60s you know extensive research started taking place in continuous casting 
and by 70s we had many plants in the world where continuous casting was used and you know producing defect free steel was a very big challenge and it is still a challenge for many grades of steel okay because of the expansion and contraction of steel and because of you know the heat extraction uh, rate from the mold being dissimilar for dissimilar uh, metals. So, therefore, the mold also uh, has evolved quite a bit and it is an evolving subject continuous casting uh, we have improved quite a bit you know the rejection rates are minimum, but it is you know people still do not want even 1 percent rejection or half a percent rejection. So, therefore, you know for better and better product uh, better and better microstructure uh, limited segregation etcetera there are many kinds of uh, research not only with AC and design, but also with the mold geometry, hmm, but also uh, with you know the kind of the movement of the mold and so on and so forth. So, it <coughs> is a continuing field of research. So, the mold mold wall you know mold is as I have shown here as a you know is not just it has one single curvature it is multiple curvature the mold is coated with some different kind of a material and all these kinds of developments are taking place in order to ensure that uh, we can cast all grades of steel we can possibly make living steel also and perhaps with no defects at all. So, molten metal enters the mold and initially what happens this mold is going to be empty right the other end is open. So, a dummy block which is a trajectory of the ingot is inserted and that is how it is going to be closed. Okay. And then once molten metal dummy, dummy block is inserted into the, this bottom part of the mold, then what happens is molten metal is poured from the tan dish or the tan dish is open. And from the tan dish here for example, I have indicated that you have a slide gate, okay. but from the tan dish typically what is known as a mono block stopper, stopper arrangement is there, the stopper is made up and down movement and as a result of which molten metal can enter from the uh, tan dish into the mold. So, as molten metal enters this is a cold dummy block. So, the molten metal starts to get welded here and as the metal starts filling up at one point of time you know, this is started to be drawn and as a result of which what happens is is formation of a solidified broom or solidified billet or a solidified slab starts and at some distance downstream these are going to be chopped into regular sizes depending on the plant and then they are going to be moved. So, there is a speed casting speed for example, and this are you know are extremely small uh, only uh, I would say less than a meter per minute that is the kind of a casting speed we are talking about uh, and the casting speeds for billet slabs and blooms etcetera which I will give you you know in the next class. <coughs> so, you can understand now as I have indicated that if there is because the tandish molten metal flows to the ACN and if there is some kind of a nozzle clogging phenomena taking place here okay, then what is going to happen molten metal is not going to come inside. We want the level to be maintained constant. So, we are drawing at a constant rate this rate is constant. So, that means the metal must be fed into the mold at a constant rate in order to have inflow and outflow balance each other, but the moment you have a you know nozzle blockage here then what happens is that even though you have synchronized now the level of the liquid is going to rise, try to rise because no more metal or you know little material is now coming into the mold and as a result of which the level of steel in the mold is going to go down because you are continuing to withdraw the molten steel you know at the uh, solidified stand at the same rate itself. And so, there is the mold level controller. If the mold level goes down, I can immediately say that there is a problem in metal flow, okay. And as a result of which we can anticipate that there may be either here or here some kind of a constriction or deposition has taken place, okay. Nozzle clogging has taken place, and that is why the molten metal is not coming into the system. At steady state operation, the depth here is constant, the depth here is constant, the flow rate from here is constant everything is maintained at a constant rate. Now, below the mold, so once the dummy block is started to withdraw, okay, then you have this is a carved mold as I have indicated and this is at the ground level and yesterday I have said that this could be at the uh, flow level 3 or something like that. The flow is under, flow is taking place purely under gravity 
okay, from ladle to tundish, from tundish to mold. And here what happens you have the cutter here for example, below the mold. So, water cooling is the major source of uh, heat extraction and we must also understand that uh, this powder is a very important constituent here, because this powder is going to be replacing you know the air film and as a result of which uh, this powder will try to control. So, therefore, the composition of the powder is very critical here you must understand. The composition of the powder will determine the rate of heat flow, because this at the end of the mold this could be about a millimeter thick okay, and this can have tremendous influence on the rate of the heat extraction. You may try to put in lot of air circula water circulation, but that may not be able to extract heat, because the largest resistance offered here is by the powder which has remained in this. So, the choice of the powder is very mold powder is very very important and for every single grade okay, uh, you know you I mean one single powder will not work for you know all the grades. So, you have great specific powder design and it is a very up you know this has solved many of the problems earlier what happens is you know trying to use one single sort of powder used to develop lot of cracks and defects in the continuous casting product, but by maneuvering the powder design okay, by improving the powder design and using the correct kind of powder, because the powder controls the heat extraction rate and because the heat extraction rate is very rapid in continuous casting. Okay. So, therefore, thermal stresses are also much larger than in got casting and as a result of which because the material is weak, its strength is not that much during the initial stage of solidification, because the temperature is high. So, the material is susceptible to crack and thermal cracks are could have you know take place, because of large extraction of heat. So, or for example, if you, do, if you if you are not able to take heat, because the powder design is not right, powder is has remained you know in the solid state, it has not become liquefied. In that case what happens is, at this particular point when the you know you draw the dummy bar you see the material is not solidified or the shell is really thin. So, at the mold exit what is the cross section if you are having like this okay, this is the mold cross section and you can see that this is the casting. So, this is the casting and this is what is known as the solidified shell. The shell has to be thick enough and you can now possibly visualize that the thickness of the cell shell will not only depend on the rate of withdrawal, but it will also depend on what kind of a powder I have used, because that powder will determine to a large extent you know the rate of its extraction. I think you can appreciate that particular point. So, therefore, you require if the shell is not too thick that it cannot withstand the ferrostatic pressure. Okay. In that case what happens? The bulging is going to take place and you will see a you know shape like this immediately below the mold exit that the strand has bulged. So, the first it is because the shell is thin and hydrostatic pressure, ferrostatic pressure has still has large density. So, it has pushed the shell and the moment it has come out of the mold you know it is now unconfined. So, therefore, it can it has bulged. Okay. And in extreme cases what happens is the bulging can rupture and then the molten metal instead of going out in this way will flow like a jet and this is called the phenomena of breakouts in continuous casting machine. Even now there are many plants where on a yearly basis one, two or three cases of breakout happen very good plants and so prevention of breakout you know is a very important exercise in continuous casting bulging and breakouts you know are warning that something you know disastrous is going to happen and not only the continuous casting operation has to be shut okay this can be disastrous in terms of you know uh, it can be hazardous as far as uh, you know the caster people etc who being uh, maybe there and the, this these are of course all contained in an enclosed area they are not exposed one cannot see them in continuous casting machine it is only this part of the acn that is visible remaining all part are encased uh, you know inside a uh, spray cooling chamber. Okay. So, below the mold, so it is water cooled and as I have indicated that the molten metal is not completely solidified as far as you go to the last. So, therefore, I would say that the solidification front will grow something like this as it goes and this is the way. So, this is the shell 
that is being formed So, how does the solidification proceeds? So, below the mold we have sprays here. Water cooled you know, water jets. And we also have rolls here. These are called guide rolls and bending rolls of different sizes. They progressively bend and make the strand. So, this is the strand deform the strand. gradually and allow it to be discharged in a horizontal manner. So, these are my sprays and the sprays are on both sides. Yes. These sprays now take out most of the heat and that is how the solidification has become complete. So, it is here that the solidification has become complete and this part is called the metallurgical length of the caster that where the complete solidification has taken place. So, this is the metallurgical. So, this point up to here from here to here is the metallurgical length of the caster. So, we have liquid here and so on. So, we will continue with this discussion in the next class.